the State of Israel, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu. Thank you very much. But do not give a title to my speech. I'm going to give you one challenge. But before I do that, I would like to thank the president of the bar University, the incoming president, my dear friend, Danny Hershkovitz. He is truly a Renaissance man. Danny was a minister of science and technology of great stature in my previous government and today following a decision that you made an outstanding decision of yours he has become the president of this important university and Danny I'm sure that you well contend with the riddle of how to balance budgets in addition to so many other issues that you will have to tackle and resolve so I um, greet Professor Kaveh and the management of the bar University, the board of the university, and my friend, Professor Moshe Ernst, former Minister of Defense of the State of Israel. And I would like to also uh, greet uh, the recipients of the awards of distinction, my friend uh, Tommy Hecht, Uzi Wertheim, and Sol Kushitsky. They all deserve all the respect and honor that you shower upon them. I recently read a book, uh, a hundred page book, written by a historian, a wonderful American historian who passed away nearly 50 years ago. And he, his name is Will Durant, and he wrote 11 books, he wrote many books, but 11 volumes about the history of civilization. And uh, toward the end of his life, he wrote one book, a 100-page book, The Lessons of History. You should read it. Highly recommended. Every line there, every word there is etched in the stone of truth. And I'm going to give you the bad news and the good news. The bad news is when you finish reading this book, you understand that in history, the large numbers, they are the decisive ones, they are the important ones. But here is the good news. On page 17, if I'm not mistaken, he mentions that perhaps there are exceptions to this rule that it is through the formulation of a cultural force we can overcome those chances and he gives the young state of Israel, this is how he calls it. He uses the, state, the young state of Israel as an example to this rule and I think that we have proven, as you said, Danny, in 65 years of existence that we ostensibly are indeed the exception to the rule but we have to continue and be that exception by maintaining and upholding our spiritual foundations. Two weeks ago, they found a medal, a gold medal near the uh, Wailing Wall. It is dated, I believe, uh, in the beginning of the seventh century. And that pendant uh, has a menorah, which is our national emblem on the one side, a Torah scroll, and on the other, a shofar. Well, there you go. All the Torah on one pendant. And that is obviously after 2,000 years of Jewish existence in the land of Israel. And this existence continues almost 4,000 years now. It turns out that there's something special in being this exception that we are in this uh, very special combination between the past heritage and the grasp of the future in all our power and talent and even our genius, I would say, all that we can find in our people. There's no doubt that this university is a part of that national endeavor, an international endeavor to maintain our heritage and to combine it with the future. Well, I do thank you for the invitation to speak to you 20 years after the foundation of the Begin Sadat Center. So many things have taken place during these years. 
on the political realm. We have signed a peace agreement with Jordan. And throughout that period, 20 years exactly, we are in constant negotiations with the uh, Palestinians. We're trying to achieve, uh, to reach a peace agreement. And despite the various, you know, um, transformations of time during those two decades, we managed to maintain the peace agreement with Egypt. It's not a piece of cake. But undoubtedly, the most significant developments in the Middle East throughout these two cent uh, decades are the ones that took place in the last few years, which overshadow all the others with respect to the entire region. And I'll mention, too, the historic upheaval that takes place in the Arab world and is now in its midst. It's very far from ending, if there is anything such as ending in history. And obviously, the efforts, the ongoing efforts of Iran to develop nuclear weapons. The goal of Iran is to take over and dominate the entire Middle East and even to go beyond the Middle East and to annihilate the State of Israel. This is no speculation. This is the goal. Israel and the U.S. see eye to eye the need to prevent Iran from arming itself with nuclear weapons. Now, the president of Iran spoke in the United Nations a few uh, days ago, and he said that Iran is interested in the nuclear uh, power only for civil, civilian purposes. This is what he said. I do not believe him. However, those who do want to examine his words should ask themselves the Iranian regime a very simple question. If you only want nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, why do you insist on centrifuges to enrich uranium and all those plutonium reactors? Because these are not required at all for the production of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. There's no need in that. However, these are the components, the most essential components for the production of uh, diffusible uh, material for uh, nuclear weapons. For you do not need them at all for uh, useful purposes. 17 countries of believers in the world, Canada, Mexico, and others. Spain, for Schweiz, example, Switzerland, Sweden, Sweden uh, Indonesia, Indonesia with uh, one quarter of a million uh, human beings and many others produce uh, this uh, nuclear energy without centrifuges, without plutonium reactors. Only those who want to prepare the fissionable uh, materials for nuclear bombs insist on those components. Not just insists, but he's willing to bring a lot of suffering to his people because that entails with a clash concerning the sanctions and the dictates of the Security Council. Why are they doing that? Perhaps because they're lacking energy? They do have all that energy in gas and oil, and they do mention natural gas because that's immediately available for the uh, management of industry and having everything run on it. They have so many resources that they can provide for the needs of large parts of the universe for many, many years to come, definitely of their own country. Well, the uh, position that should uh, be taken by the international community vis-a-vis -vis Iran is the following. We are willing to reach a diplomatic solution, indeed, but only such a solution that would break down the ability or remove uh, those capabilities from Iran of developing nuclear weapons. That means no centrifuges and no uranium enrichment, no plutonium reactors. And as long as Iran has not disarmed itself of those uh, centrifuges and those uh, plutonium reactors, the, we should not let go at all from those sanctions, quite the contrary. We should add to them. And the, the truth is very simple. It's very sharp. It really sharps and cuts very sharply through the fog that people try to disperse around us here. If their faces aim toward peace, they should agree 
if their face is not facing peace, they will not agree. However, perhaps the formula have, has to be more succinct. If they disarm themselves, they will get it, and if they don't, they won't. And that's a tough struggle, because the human tendency is to hope, to believe, to try, to be ready to try, but not in this open-ended experiment without any criteria. Definitely not without having a very sober vision, a smart and sober uh, vision along the attempt to block the armament of Iran and the wish to preserve the peace agreements with uh, Jordan and Egypt, you want to bring about the end of conflict with the Palestinians. Achieving a truthful peace and security, tangible security, not on paper, tangible, real security on the ground for us, for our children and grandchildren. That is the wish of all citizens of the State of Israel. In order to bring about the end of conflict, one has to understand what is the root cause of that conflict. I bring this up because in my view, all the discussions on the topic of the uh, conflict between us and the Palestinians, that at least one thing, at least one thing has been achieved about. And that is that those who thought that that's the core of the conflict in the Middle East, well, that one can no longer say without sounding ridiculous, it's not the core of the conflict. It is not the core of what is happening in Libya or in Tunisia or in Algeria or in Egypt or in Yemen or in Syria or in Iraq and so on and so forth. However, for years and years, we were told that the core of the conflict of the Middle East is the Palestinian issue. And how shall I say it? It's this holy, sacred cow is one of the uh, victims of the Arab Revolution. But in the same token, one can say that there is a second sacred cow. When you ask many, what is that root cause of that conflict? Because if you want to provide a solution, if you want to provide uh, some remedy to a particular problem, what you need to do is, first of all, to have the right diagnosis of that malady. Well, when one asks what's the root of that conflict, usually there's a ready-made answer. The occupation, the territories, the settlements, it's one and the same. This takeover of Israel over those territories, quote-unquote, the Judea and Samaria territories after the Six-Day War, those settlements, that is what makes, perpetuates the uh, conflict. That's what's generated the conflict to a large extent. And I'm sa asking, is that really so? The conflict, as far as I'm concerned, if I were to uh, pick the date when that had practically started, then I would determine the following date, and that is in 1921, on the day on which Palestinian Arabs attacked the immigrants' a house in Jaffa, in that attack a number of Jews got killed, among them the author Yudchet Brenner. This attack was targeted against the Jewish immigration. My grandfather reached that house in Yafo uh, one year earlier, and like him, many others did. This attack obviously was not leveled because of territories or because of settlements. It was merely against the immigration of Jews to the land of Israel. And then came additional uh, attacks in 1929. Very cruelly, the Jewish, the ancient uh, Jewish uh, uh, Yeshuv in Hebron 
was massacred. Uh, it was, it resided there for nearly 4,000 years. And then in 1936 and 1939, the uh, uh, pogroms, uh, systemic attacks against the Jewish Yishuv in Israel. And then came the partition plan in 1947. And a proposal came up for a Jewish, uh, for an Arab state. They didn't say a Palestinian state. They said an Arab state and a Jewish state. The Jews agreed. The Arabs refused. Because the topic was not then, and I'm telling you it isn't today either, the question of the Palestinian state. The question was and remains, regretfully, the Jewish state. In other words, until 1967, and definitely then too, that, you know, in a way, Strangle, uh, a strangling loop, as it were, came around us, aiming uh, to actually put us out, this suffocating grip against our neck, around our neck. There was no occupation back then, unless Tel Aviv is considered an occupied area, and Jaffa too is occupied territory. There were no settlements back then. But during 46 years, from 1929 until 1967, it's nearly half a century. Half a century, nearly. This Arab population attacked us regardless of the settlement, regardless of whatever is presented as the historic core of the conflict. I'm saying these things. Because one might say, well, that ended back then. But then it all changed. Well, later, you know, the events developed the way they uh, did. And we, you know, we drew from Gaza down to the last centimeters. We uprooted localities and settlements. And the attack continues against us. Some 10,000 rockets that were fired at us from the Gaza territory that we have evacuated. And when we ask, those launchers and the ones behind them, why are you firing at us? They say in order to uh, liberate Palestine. And what is that Palestine, Judea and Samaria? Of course not. Yeah, well, that too, yes. But they say, Beersheba and Ashkelon and Machdal and Akko and Yafo. Okay, these say the Hamas and Islamic Jihad, but the more moderate uh, entities in Judea and Samaria, the PA, are not dealing with terrorism. That's true, and that's a major distinction. They're not engaged in terrorism. But when they are requested to say, okay, so do you recognize? Not Judea and Samaria, not the West Bank. Are you willing to recognize the Jewish state at long last? And they say, we are willing to recognize the Israeli people. We are willing to recognize Israel. So I'm saying, but that's not the question I'm asking you. Are you willing to recognize the Jewish state, the state of the Jewish nation, the nation state of the Jewish people? And the answer to this very day is no. Why not? I, in my speech four years ago, said that the solution is a Palestinian state that is uh, demilitarized, and that's very clear why, in view of our past experience, a real demilitarization that is going for with very specific uh, security arrangements without multinational forces, but a Jewish state that would be recognized by you. Why aren't you willing to recognize the Jewish state? We are willing to recognize your nation state for a very, very high cost because it occupies our homeland. It's nothing trivial. I'm saying this here too. It's very hard, of course. But you too will have to make a series of concessions. And the first concession is to forego the dream of the right of return. We cannot suffice with the fact that you will recognize the Israeli people or some binational state that you will flood with refugees later on. This is the nation state of the Jewish people. Jews, if they want, immigrate to Israel. Palestinian Arabs, if they want, they can go and live in your nation state. But you should recognize the Jewish state. And as long as they do not do that, 
no peace would be made. Only once they recognize our right to live here in a sovereign state of our own, our own nation state, it is only then that peace will be made possible. And I'm emphasizing this here. It's a prerequisite. It's an essential condition. There are other conditions that are important for the uh, termination of the uh, negotiations, not for its existence, only its termination. But I'm mentioning this because the process, the political, the diplomatic process between us and the Palestinians involves a solution of very complex problems. However, it will be crowned as success only if it is based on foundations of truth, the truth of the present and the historic truth. Regretfully, truth is under an ongoing attack on the part of our enemies and rivals. They are attempting to undermine this ancient bond that we have, the bond between our people and the land of Israel, and also the very basic facts of the conflict between us and the Palestinians in the 20th century. For example, I heard a few days ago the representative of Iran stammering about the Nazi crimes. It's very hard for them to mention the word Holocaust. However, immediately, he adds very decisively that statement that Zionists should not be given the opportunity to take advantage of the Nazi crimes, namely the Holocaust, in order to harm the Palestinians. The representatives of Iran repeat this well-known version that the Holocaust took place regardless of the Palestinian issue. And then the leaders of Zionism came along and used the Holocaust, exploited it in order to uh, drive away the Palestinians. So what are the actual facts? The leader of the Palestinian national movement in the first half of the 20th century was Mufti Haj Amin al-Husseini. Nobody questioned his leadership. He was the living spirit behind those uh, attacks from 1921 in Yafo all the way to the Second World War, and all that is known. However, here are a few facts about the activity of the Mufti that are not as known. On the 28th of November 1941, the Mufti flew to Berlin and met with Hitler. He expressed to Hitler his willingness to cooperate with Germany in every possible way, and that is what he did both in recruiting Muslim combatants to the SS in the Balkans and also in propaganda uh, broadcasts for the Nazis. For example, a typical example for a propaganda broadcast of the Mufti from 1942. And I quote, if England is uh, uh, defeated and its allies are defeated, uh, we will have reached the final solution for the Jewish people. Uh, and to us, that is the worst problem. Between the years 1942 and 1944, he operated from his base in Berlin and tried to prevent the rescue of Jews, rescue of Jews from Hungary, from Germany, from Bulgaria, from Croatia, that despite their subjugation, in actual fact, to Hitler, they allowed Jews to flee to the land of Israel and other places. The Mufti protested that the Nazis did not allocate enough resources to prevent the fleeing of uh, Jewish refugees from the Balkans. In their testimony he, in the he gave in the Nuremberg trials in 1947 on the 6th of August, the German clerk Wilhelm Melchers said that the Mufti has voiced, and that's a quote, he voiced protests everywhere in the Bureau of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Secretary of State in additional headquarters of the SS. On the 13th of May 1943, for example, the Mufti submitted a letter to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ribbentrop, in which he protested against the understandings made by Germany that allowed for the deportation of 4,000 Jewish children from Bulgaria. He wanted to see them all, and that's a quote, he wanted to see them all annihilated. So the deputy of Eichmann 
Dieter Wislitschke gave in the Nierman trials this uh, uh, terrible testimony. The Mufti carried out a role in the decision to annihilate the European jury. One cannot undermine the importance of his role. The Mufti repeated and reiterated his uh, proposal to Hitler and Ribbentrop and Himmler to destroy the European jury. He saw this as an appropriate and adequate solution to the Palestinian issue. And Slitsny, yeah, I have has given an oral testimony concerning the direct involvement of the Mufti in the final solution. And I quote, the Mufti was one of those who initiated the systemic destruction and annihilation of the Jews in Europe and was a, an accomplice of Eichmann and Hitler in the execution of this plan. He was one of the best friends of Eichmann and constantly urged him to ac accelerate the destruction actually in, with my very own eyes, uh, ears, he said. I heard him tell that he visited incognity in the gas chambers of Auschwitz together with Eichmann. Ladies and gentlemen, in a way that runs counter to what the representatives of Iran and others are telling us, the leaders of Zionism did not use the Holocaust in order to destroy the national Palestinian movement. Quite the contrary, the senior leader of the Palestinians at the time, the Mufti Haj Amin al-Husseini, is the one who preached and advocated for the execution of the Holocaust in order to destroy the Zionist movement. And that nearly succeeded. The European jury was indeed destroyed and annihilated entirely because of the efforts of the Mufti, but Zionism was not annihilated and the State of Israel was established. I mention this here because these roots, it is these roots, is this, this uh, terrible weed that needs to be uprooted. The Mufti is still an admired figure in the national Palestinian movement. Just visit those websites. Visit the schools. Visit the textbooks. It is definitely their weed, the most terrible weed that needs to be uprooted, and that is the root of the conflict, and that is what perpetuates it. And the root of the conflict was and remains and still is what comes up for more than 19 years out. That's very deep opposition among these hardcore Palestinian people against the right of the Jewish people to have a state of their own in the land of Israel. So that the process that we're in, for it to be significant, for it to stand a real chance to succeed, it is necessary to uh, listen from, to hear from the Palestinian leadership that they recognize the right of the Jewish people to have a state of their own, hence the state of Israel. I do hope that that will happen so that we'll be able to progress toward a genuine solution of this uh, resolution for this uh, conflict. There are many, many other topics that we will definitely have to resolve during the negotiations. First and foremost, it is providing a sustainable solution for the security needs of the State of Israel in this unstable and perilous area that we live in. Because even if we achieve this recognition after generations one might say of incitement that still carries out we do not have security we do not have confidence that this recognition would trickle down into the crevices and the hearts of the Palestinian peop people on all its strata so what we need is very solid security arrangements so that we can protect peace or protect ourselves whenever that peace is undermined. That is a realistic approach, a responsible approach that is willing to go forward, however, not blindly. And that brings to mind something else, too. And I think that a prerequisite for the arrival of genuine solution has been and still is clear 
as clear blue sky, and that's the removal of the refusal to recognize the right of the Jewish people for a state of their own in the land of their founding fathers, and has the most important key for the resolution of this conflict, and that is the recognition of this right. I do believe in the strength of the Jewish people as well as that of the State of Israel. What we have managed to accomplish here in 65 years is indeed a miracle. We are marking the 40th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. The population of the State of Israel has grown in these 40 years by two and a half. Uh, the GNP has grown 25 times more. It's as if you took 25 economies of the State of Israel and if you've placed them one next to the other. The achievements in every field and every sphere, in absorption, in immigration, technology and science, in uh, freeing the economy, in opening the, uh, in developing the Negev and the Galilee, the cyber city that we're establishing in Beersheba, in the biotechnology city that are, is going to be established in Safed, or is actually happening before our eyes. These are major achievements. We did not wait for our, our neighbors to develop our country. We simply carry on developing it, and there's a link between them. The greater our strength is, the, the, the stronger and more secure our country and our economy, the stronger our society is, the stronger we are, the better the chances that this transformation would take place also among our neighbors. We should never give it up. It's necessary for the securing of our future and our peace. Thank you very much to all of you.